Okay, so I am here with HG Tudor, who has so graciously agreed to speak with me and to share all of his information and knowledge pertaining to narcissism. And I'm really excited for everything that we're going to discuss today. So HG, if you can take a moment and introduce yourself, please. Hello, Faye. Thank you for introducing me and uh, involving me in the program today. Uh, yes, my name is H.G. Tudor. It isn't my real name. I use a pseudonym, which uh, I do as a consequence of ensuring that the information that I provide doesn't cause a problem for me in my personal and private life. Uh, I'm a diagnosed narcissistic psychopath, which means that I both have narcissistic personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. I have a high level of insight into what I am and also the behaviours of people similar to me, my kind, as I often refer to them. So I understand other narcissists and psychopaths because I spent a lot of time with them and amongst them, observing them, interacting with them and so forth. And that's enabled me to gather a huge amount of information, not only in terms of understanding myself, but also understanding those of a similar nature to me, but they are different types of narcissists. And therefore, I've accumulated all of this information and disseminate it through my blog, through my YouTube channel, platforms on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And through consultations with people and through the provision of particular products so other people can make sense of what they've been dealing with um, to enable them <laughs> excuse me to understand more about the ensnarement that they may find themselves in whether that's in a romantic setting or a familiar setting or a social environment or work or with a neighbor and equip them with the tools to not only remove their confusion and bewilderment at what's going on but to take steps to enable them to achieve freedom. Thank you for explaining that. And can you speak to how you came to understand that you are a both a narcissist and a psychopath? Well, I've always known that I'm different from other people. As a child, the way that I would interact with people was different, for instance, from that of the way that my siblings would and I would see them behave in a way which seemed alien to me and then ironically they would often jokingly refer to me as the alien because my responses weren't along the lines of theirs so for instance when one of my siblings was crying I asked what is that not what's wrong but what is that because it was unfamiliar to me and I asked why is water leaking from your face because I didn't understand the concept of sadness and tears. So I always knew that I was different, and I always knew, as I started to get a bit older, that I became bored very quickly, and therefore engaging in certain behaviours alleviated that boredom. I also recognised that I needed the reaction of other people, and I enjoyed playing with other people. I needed to own them, I needed to make them mine. And... As a consequence of this, I knew that I was different from other people, and there are other instances besides, but it wasn't until um, I was older that a former girlfriend of mine, who was a psychology graduate, explained to me that she believed that I was both psychopath and narcissist. And I said, that's very interesting, tell me more. And she did so without judgment, but purely by way of explanation. As I listened to her explain, I thought, well, some of what she is saying does indeed make sense. So I explained to her at the end of her monologue, that's all very interesting, thank you very much, I now need to be about other things, and then went away and did some further uh, reading about uh, what she had been referring to, and it resonated with me, and I thought, ah, now I have some labels that I can attach to myself, but I recognised that it wasn't a very good idea going around telling people that those were those labels that were attached to me. It just brought me understanding. So it was a gradual path towards recognising and understanding what I am. And then later on, as a consequence of involvement with what I call the good doctors, I received the formal diagnosis to which I referred earlier. 
And when she, just out of curiosity, when she was saying what she thought you might be, how your mm -hmm. narcissism did not in that time kick in and have you deny it, that you were able to remain so open-minded to it. Can you explain that? Well, what you've got to recognize is that amongst narcissists, most are unaware. And you're right that with many narcissists, they would just deny it and go, that's not me. What are you talking about? However, there are aware narcissists, aware psychopaths, but the difference is you, we've got to recall and understand that what I pursue with regard to my narcissism is what I call the prime aims. So that's control of everybody that comes up on my radar, fuel character traits and residual benefits. I won't explain what those things are now, but focusing on the issue of control. I have to have control of somebody and they either show that they are or they threaten it. Or I don't know if I've got that control, which means, therefore, I must get it. One way that the narcissism would afford control in that situation would be through not allowing that narcissist to know what she was saying was cr true and deny it. What, another way, which is the way that I've evolved to enable me to have that control, is to recognize the validity of what she is saying, but not admit it to her. Because I didn't say to her, you're right, you're absolutely right, that's what I am. Because that would have been a moronic thing to do, because that would have been a transference of power, Faye. And so I, whatever quirk you might want to say of the way that my narcissism has developed, allowing me this insight to know what I am, but nevertheless, it still functioned to cause me to say, that's very interesting. Thanks for sharing that with me. I must go now and be about other things. Namely, I didn't tell her that I accepted what she told me, which then enabled me to continue to control her. And by withdrawing from the situation, I maintained control in my world. So many narcissists would go, what are you talking about? That doesn't apply to me. That's wrong. No, that's not accurate. No, you do those things. So there'd be lashings of denial and blame shifting and projection. For me... I am allowed to recognize my me, but I don't admit it to her. Thus, I still maintain the control that is required. That's a really good explanation. Thank you for that. And you were saying that you always knew that there was something different about you and commenting to one of your siblings while they were crying, what's that falling from your eyes? So mm. can you speak more to what it was? I'm going to infer from that that you felt a sense of emptiness inside of you and a lack of empathy. So can you share more what it's like to grow up with a lack of empathy and with a sense of empathy? And is, what does what come from? Is the emptiness from the psycho, psychopathology and is the lack of empathy from the narcissism? So can you speak a little bit more as to that? Well, both psychopaths and narcissists don't have any emotional empathy. So it would come from both. Both have an emptiness. The difference with the emptiness is that narcissists fight against it. The emptiness is a reminder that they, in a, in a sense, don't exist, that they, there is nobody really there. And therefore, they fight against that by provoking reactions from people, what I call fuel, which fills up or seeks to fill up that emptiness. So the narcissist, and most narcissists are unaware, subconsciously doesn't want the emptiness to take a hold of them. So when that emptiness makes itself, its presence felt through the reduction of fuel, the narcissist feels edgy, nervous, anxious. And the lower that fuel level goes, the worse that sensation becomes where it could tilt them into a form of depression. They feel in a sense of impending doom. They feel like that the walls of their environment are going to come crashing down on them, but they don't know what it is. They just have that sensation. And it's because their fuel levels are dropping. And then as they receive that fuel, and it starts to fill up the emptiness, those unpleasant sensations recede until it gets to a point where 
if you like, the negative aspect of it has been balanced out. And then it starts to become a positive effect for them. So the narcissist starts to feel more relaxed, more confident than supremely enthusiastic, buoyed, powerful, fizzing with energy, feeling invulnerable, feeling like a colossus striding the earth as the fuel levels go upwards. So the narcissist fights against that emptiness. The psychopath embraces the emptiness. The psychopath is, in essence, comfortable with there being nothing there. The issue is more to do with boredom, that there is always this need to alleviate the boredom and neither experience contentment. Now, I'm a hybrid of the two. So that means that I embrace the emptiness to an extent, but I also have to fight against it to a degree. So I need fuel, but not to the same extent as a pure narcissist. They need more than I do. So I, for instance, can have periods on my own, which doesn't cause me any major difficulties. And in fact, I often embrace that because I don't like people. I find for the most part people annoying and irritating and they bore me quickly. There are some people that don't and therefore those are individuals that I'm likely to maintain an interaction with because they hold my interest for longer periods than others. So, and I am creating work on this to help people understand it further. If you like, there's a distinction between the pure psychopath, the pure narcissist, and then the hybrid, which is what I am, which is the narcissistic psychopath. So I'm curious if you feel like narcissists have a love-hate relationship with people, or if that's perhaps the psychopath, because you're saying you don't like people, but there's also an element of like perhaps needing people. So mm -hmm. I'm curious if you could speak to that on your opinion on that. Well, <clears throat> with the narcissist, the narcissist operates in black and white. So you're either a hero or a zero. So the narcissist either thinks that you're the best person and the best thing since sliced bread, or you're an awful, treacherous, awful individual. And when you're painted white, everything about you is magnificent and wonderful and special. And the narcissist is motivated to treat you well because you're seen in that positive light. And when you're painted black, the narcissist is motivated to treat you badly because you've let the narcissist down from the narcissist perspective, that you are a problem. And that black and white can alternate with a person many times in the course of a day. Sometimes somebody can be fixed white for a long period of time and then suddenly become black. And you can be moved to a position of black without you actually having done anything it can be as a consequence of changes within the fuel matrix. So somebody else's behavior alters our view of you. So it becomes rather capricious uh, in terms of uh, people would think, oh, I'll try and gauge whether I'm black or white. And a lot of the time you can't because there are factors that you don't know about that influences that outcome. So with the narcissist, the narcissist views people in terms of black, and why with the psychopath it's generally more in terms of not necessarily having to bother with people so there's often instances of being a loner and then those people are just there to be utilized it's the same way that a narcissist uses people for the prime aims but with a psychopath there's less of the sort of black and white that's associated it's more are you of use to me or not because of that hyper focus that a psychopath will have so if you're of use to me i may well spare you because you are enabling me to achieve something or i'm now going to be downright unpleasant and awful to you because i'm bored and i want to play with you and again there is a capriciousness that's there with also with the psychopath but it's linked to the need to alleviate the boredom and to achieve a, a goal so if a particularly a psychopath, a psychopath, which is more intelligent, recognizes that you can be used in that psychopath's plan to embezzle some money, you'll be brought into the plan and you will be charmed and you will be treated well in order to bring you under that control and enable the psychopath to achieve their aim. 
But if you then cease, cease to be useful or that you are threatening the sense of control by virtue of not doing what the psychopath wants, then you could be disposed of both in terms of just shoved to one side or um, disposed of in the sense of being killed with certain psychopaths that are violent. Not all psychopaths are violent, most aren't. So there are differing views um, and it's the narcissist that has the black and white view and narcissists are far more prevalent than psychopaths. So with my work, although I talk about both, I talk more about narcissism because that's the one that affects people to a greater degree because narcissists need to interact with people. Hence, more people are involved with narcissists and there are more narcissists than there are psychopaths. So I think that's a, that will segue really well into the next question, which is what percentage of the population do you think? And I know it's it must be underreported because narcissists don't necessarily think that they're the problem and that wouldn't lead mm -hmm. them to going out and getting to be assessed. But in yes. your opinion, what percentage of the population do you think is narcissistic? Well, I'll draw a distinction there. When you talk about narcissistic, mm. I categorize people into empaths, normals, narcissistic people who are not narcissists and narcissists. So I think you're asking me what proportion are narcissists Correct. and based on my experience one in six there's no survey that's done um, there are other people that put it at a lower amount but based upon my own experience of many years of being in and amongst my kind I place it at one in six and that's certainly borne out by many of the experiences of the people that I consult with it's higher than people realize now of course you're always going to have an argument about that amount because there is no survey. And as you quite rightly point out, Faye, most uh, narcissists aren't going to come along and sort of identify that they are one. And therefore it has to be the judgment of others to make that determination. And we could of course look at a statistically significant proportion of people in the population and make a determination based upon that. But you also have the issue as you do with any sort of with anything that's linked to mental health and personality, that you uh, have to look at the behaviours over a long period of time to make that assessment, which doesn't make it particularly easy when it comes to conducting a survey. Furthermore, you also have the issue, of course, that people apply different standards to the behaviours that they are witnessing. So there's always going to be some subjectivity that bleeds into it. And you will get those that will say, well, you have people that are what you'd call clinical narcissists and then a lot of subclinical narcissists. So people who are, but I would suggest the subclinical are the narcissistic people, i.e. people with strong narcissistic traits, low empathic traits and limited emotional empathy, but they're not narcissists. But based upon many years of being around my kind and interacting with my kind and observing my kind, I'd place it at one in six. Can you tell me from your perspective being, I know you refer to yourself as an ultra, what mm. the perspective of being an ultra is like when you encounter other narcissists and for someone who is not an ultra, what it would be like mm. for them when they would encounter another narcissist? Okay. I categorize myself as ultra because of the level of insight that I have and the ability to convey this information to people, which nobody else does. When I come across another narcissist, I'm able to identify that they are fairly quickly, 10 to 15 minutes of interaction with them, sometimes even quicker than that. My view of them varies. Invariably, with what I uh, categorize as lesser and mid-range narcissists, <clears throat> excuse me, doesn't mean that they're less of a narcissist. It just means they are narcissists. But on my scale, you have lesser, which is divided into lower, lesser, middle, lesser, upper, lesser, A, upper, lesser, B. Then mid-range, which is divided into lower, mid-range, middle, mid-range, A, middle, mid-range, B, and upper, mid-range. And then greater, lower, greater, middle, greater, upper, greater, and then me, the ultra. Greater narcissists are aware, lesser and mid-range are unaware. So where I deal with lesser and mid-range, with lessers, I generally find them quite amusing because they're so obvious in the way that they behave. So 
a general hallmark of lesser narcissists is that they don't operate with a facade. So that includes the guy that runs around like a dog with six digs, sleeping with everything that moves. You know, he's always looking at himself in the mirror. Uh, perhaps the, the classic view of a narcissist that many people would have if they don't really understand it. The, the guy that's seen as in love with himself, he always thinks he's onto the next big thing in terms of a business, that he's going to make loads of money, that he thinks he's absolutely gorgeous. And even if he is really good looking, he's totally vain, or he might be deluded as to his looks. Um, you then get uh, like the lower lesser, who's you know a loser, basically. He's always falling out with people, stealing money in and out of prison. He has no regard for the law. He doesn't hold down a job. He might have children by multiple women that he doesn't support, etc. So they're rather obvious in their behaviours. They don't pretend to be anything other than what they are, in effect. And I find them, as mentioned, rather amusing because they're just so obvious and so basic. Mid-range narcissists, I generally have a lot of contempt for. They're the ones that operate with the facade. So lower mid-range narcissists tend to project this facade of, I'm essentially a good person, but bad things keep happening to me and it's not my fault. Middle, mid-range A and B, they are the most passive aggressive and they operate a facade of generally being, I'm really helpful. And so I'm kind and empathic and you find false empaths in this group. And with the middle, middle range A, what they do is they portray themselves as, um, they're often sort of an overwhelming angel, always busying themselves in other people's business, always wanting to help out, always telling you how you should lead your life, being prescriptive as to those behaviours, but naturally um, complete hypocrites. So they'll tell you you should do this and then they're doing it and you mustn't do it that way. And then they engage in the very thing that they're saying that you ought not to do but they don't see it. But they operate this facade of helpfulness. Middle, middle range B is similar, but theirs is, I don't understand why people have got it in for me. I'm such a kind person and so many people hate on me. I don't get it. That grouping and then with upper mid range, they have more of a facade of superiority. Yeah, I'm, I'm the best and so you should respect me. Again, I find that quite amusing, but with the lower mid range, middle, middle range A, middle, middle range B, I have complete contempt for them. I often refer to them as mealy-mouthed, shriveled up, worn up, bold, cowardly, middle-mid-range narcissists. And what irritates me about them is this holier-than-thou approach that they have, where they make themselves out to be this kind and giving individual, but their behaviour is to the contrary of that. And it's their cowardice that irritates me the most, that they don't, uh, they don't just put it out there. Uh, they whinge a lot of the time and I really don't like whinging so I have no loyalty to other narcissists with graters there is a sort of begrudging respect that's there because they're often uh, considerable achievers they know what they are and it's almost like they're two sharks swimming by one another recognizing one another with a sort of courteous nod and then moving on I will use narcissists so I will use them as lieutenants, perhaps as an attack dog. There might be a useful upper lesser type B, the bullying sort that I can use. Um, there are narcissists that I have in a friendship group. I've had intimate relationships with narcissists, not as uh, uh, a girlfriend or partner, but just where I uh, use them for uh, sex, et cetera. I would, never I would never take another narcissist as an intimate partner primary source. I would just use them as what I call a secondary source. So I have no loyalty to them and I view them essentially like anybody else. Their appliance is there to be used. Um, but uh, my view is, as I've mentioned, with the lessers, I find them amusing. With the greaters, there's a degree of respect there. And with the mid-rangers, it's largely contempt for them. How do I look at non-narcissists, basically, in a similar way, namely their prey and they're there to be utilised to my aims? So I must control them, draw fuel from them, get character traits from them and residual benefits, which I can do with narcissists as well. And I can control narcissists, but it's far easier to control non-narcissists, particularly empathic people, because they have an addiction to the narcissist, which makes them easier to ensnare and easier to keep ensnared. So... Anybody who's a human being is there to be used by me. You are simply a device, an appliance, which I will use for my advantage. 
I don't care about you. I don't love you. I'm not compassionate towards you. I can create the impression of that in order to manipulate you, but I, there's simply nothing there in terms of an attachment to you. I attach you to me. I'm never attached to you. So I think that's a brilliant explanation. Um, I want to come back to this point of the narcissist and empath relationship in a moment, but mm -hmm. what in your summation would it be like when two non greater or ultra narcissists meet where they don't know what they are and they don't know what the other person is? How would that necessarily play out? Well, there's a very, um, there's various combinations, which would take a very long time for me to go through each and every one. So it's not so simple as saying this is what the reaction will be every single time. I do have some uh, videos on my YouTube channel, which is uh, knowing the narcissist HG Tudor, the ultra for anybody who'd like to go and learn more. And where I talk about when narcissists collide. So there is no one size fits all. But rather, in some instances, it'll be chaotic. The two of them will clash. There'll be an initial seduction, and then they will fall out pretty quickly. In other instances, there'll be some longevity in the relationship because you'll have a more aggressive narcissist and then a passive aggressive narcissist. And therefore, they can both actually get control of one another. So, for example, they might have an argument and the more aggressive narcissists say some horrible things to the less aggressive narcissist. And as a consequence of that, the less aggressive narcissist walks off in a sulk. The aggressive narcissist feels a sense of control, basically through, yeah, I told it to them straight and they've run away from me. I win. The other narcissist thinks, I'm not putting up being spoken to that way. I'm removing myself from this douche canoe. I win. So they both believe that they've won because there are different ways of asserting control over another person. And that also includes another narcissist. And so they will have a relationship that endures, but it's a tempestuous one. So you have some instances where the narcissists are drawn together and it's explosive in terms of the seduction. And then they part ways fairly quickly because they just cannot control one another so they part they disengage from one another in other instances you will have a tempestuous relationship but it endures for the reasons that i explained where they both feel as though they keep getting control over one another in other instances you have the process of what i call narcissistic cementation where the relationship endures and appears to be a successful one there will be behind the scenes problems, but not to the extent of the earlier example. And that often happens where a greater is in the mix, where the greater is puppeteering the other narcissist and the other narcissist stays in the, uh, stays in the relationship because the skill of the greater is such that they can manipulate them without necessarily being overly harmful to them because the greater uses a lot of charm and persuasion to get what they want. And although the greater, of course, will do whatever he or she wants, the other narcissist, let's say, uh, let's choose a middle, middle range A, subconsciously recognizes that they really do benefit from being with this narcissist, even though they don't know that that person is a narcissist, because that greater narcissist is wealthy, has huge connections, wields tremendous power. So a useful example there would be, to be Bill and Hillary Clinton. So he's an aware narcissist, she isn't. So he knows he puppets her. She doesn't realize that she's being puppeted. She recognizes that he does things which are problematic, but she accepts that because it enables her to achieve things that she requires vis-a-vis -vis the prime aims. So for instance, Hillary Clinton once said, there are worse things that can happen in a marriage than infidelity. Now, most people who aren't narcissists would go, Infidelity is probably one of the worst things that can happen in a marriage because you're choosing somebody else over me. You're showing no emotional empathy for me. You know, that, that strikes at the heart of our relationship. It damages trust, etc. So that gives you insight into the way that her mind works by saying that, that essentially, if the narcissist deems that he's allowed to play away, she still feels a sense of control because she has given it, in effect, her blessing 
she has said, you're allowed to sleep with other people. Therefore, because I've allowed it, I still feel like I've got control. And she stays in that relationship because she has deemed it's okay for him to sleep around, therefore doesn't feel any shame or embarrassment or feel that it's a threat to control. Of course, it will probably be along the lines of as long as you're not particularly obvious about it. Although, of course, getting a blowjob off somebody in the Oval Office is pretty obvious, isn't it? But largely, if you're engaging these things behind the scenes and keep it quiet, we're okay. Because her narcissism recognises that there's so much more to gain by staying with him. Prestige, wealth, power, all of those things. So her narcissism trades it up, basically does the trade off and thinks, I'll suffer that supposed devaluation of him playing around because there's so much more to gain from the relationship. And he can still do what he wants, but he recognizes a value in keeping her around, for instance, because it's useful to present this front of a political marriage, which is advantageous to him. So he knows what he's doing in terms of the manipulations and, and that he seeks fuel. He won't call it necessarily fuel, he'll call it something else. But with this cementation, the two narcissists stick together for a long period of time, not to say that it's all rainbows and unicorns, far from it, but nor is it as tempestuous as the other relationships that I've mentioned. And that's the cementation. I'll be doing more work about that to go into greater detail, but that's an example. So those are some instances of where narcissists collide. And there's so many different combinations. There's lots of potential different outcomes. And as I mentioned, I have a couple of videos which go into greater detail showing you some of those combinations across romantic settings, work settings, familial settings, and social settings. That's incredible. And I am going to link all of your information uh, down below when I post this uh, to YouTube. So everyone, I'm mm -hmm. going to encourage everyone to check it out. There is a wealth of information. It's the amount of work that you have put into this is really incredible. And a lot of people I think are going to be, I mean, I, I see the comments on your videos. There's a lot of thankful people as it is, but yes, <laughs> the amount of work that you do is truly astounding. Thank now, you. I well, that's part of what I am. I'm uh, yeah. extremely industrious. I did want to ask you, because I, I feel like there's a lot of empaths that are watching this. So I did want you to speak more about the relationship between the narcissist and the okay. empath. Okay. Empaths are our prime prey. As I briefly mentioned earlier on, Faye, empaths are addicted to narcissists. And that means that you experience something that's called emotional thinking. So that doesn't mean that you're hysterical. It means that you just don't operate with logic. And that means that you either don't see the red flags when a narcissist comes along, or if you do, you don't pay attention to them. And so you end up, it's easier to draw you in and it's easier to keep you under control. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that every empath remains locked in with the narcissist forever. Naturally, there comes a point where it's too much and the empath may well escape. But it's more common for the narcissist to get rid of the empath rather than for the empath to escape. The dynamic between the narcissist and the empath takes on various forms, dependent upon, of course, the nature of the relationship. The romantic relationship, of course, is one where probably the most damage is caused. There, you could have, for instance, a narcissist has a one night stand with somebody and then never bothers with them again. That person is known as an, as an intimate tertiary source. They're essentially a stranger that we control by having sex with them, draw fuel from them, from their reactions whilst having sex with them and talking with them. And then we don't bother with them again. It might be, for instance, that it was just somebody that we met in a city that we were visiting. It might be, for instance, that they're a prostitute. It might just be uh, somebody that we've met whilst out and our narcissism decrees that it's not appropriate to, con to contact them again. More usually, there is repeat action. And that's where the person is an intimate partner secondary source. And what happens here is there is a shelf dynamic. The shelf dynamic can also apply 
also applies to friends and family, non-intimate secondary sources. But with the intimate partner secondary source, this is where, for instance, you're dating the narcissist. So what happens is you come up on the narcissist radar and the narcissist takes you off the shelf by going on a date with you or having a weekend with you or ringing you up and speaking to you on the phone for an hour or having a text exchange over two hours. And in this dynamic, what happens is you're largely treated well because you're potentially on the path to becoming the intimate partner primary source. And also, because you're not spending inordinate amounts of time with the narcissist, there's less opportunity, to put it bluntly, to piss us off so that we have to devalue you. So your fuel tends to remain fresh and stimulating for us, and you have less chance of annoying us. And therefore, you're largely treated well, but you will get what are called corrective devaluation. So if you threaten our control, you'll get essentially a slap across the wrists. So you might be told you're out of line or we might ignore your telephone call. The problem with this relationship for the empathic victim is that often you are wanting the relationship to be placed on a more solid footing and it doesn't happen. And the intimate partner secondary source relationship is also applicable to somebody, for instance, who is conducting an affair with a married narcissist. So they're on the outside, they're the other man or the other woman, and they're always waiting for that call, waiting to be told when they could hook up. And it's a somewhat lonely existence, and they're an afterthought. Now, when that happens, the narcissist isn't expressly treating that person badly. But of course, it feels that way, because they're on the outside. And so that person can stay as an intimate partner, secondary source for years and years and years. Or if the narcissism recognizes that this person is a really good prize, it shunts them to what's known as the candidate intimate partner, secondary source, where the narcissist goes hell for leather to bring you under control. And this is where the love bombing comes in. So this is where you get the blitz of flatteries and compliments and then you're taken to lots of places and the narcissist spends lots of time with you so unlike the shelf dynamic where the narcissist might see you on the saturday and then not see you for two weeks the narcissist is ringing you every day there's those telephone calls that go on through the night the narcissist keeps calling around wants to spend time with you each and every day and then after being the candidate intimate partner secondary source although it's not guaranteed you may well then become the intimate partner primary source. And this essentially is the relationship that people hear about in terms of the dynamic between narcissist and empath. So you're seduced as a secondary source, you're embedded as a primary source, and you have the golden period. Everything's wonderful. The narcissist thinks that you're fantastic. You're complimented, you're bought presents, you're taken to nice places, you're introduced to friends and family, it's great sex, you think you've found the person of your dreams. The narcissist mirrors your behaviours, likes your likes, dislikes your dislikes, and so you think, this person is amazing. Then, devaluation occurs, and it always happens with the intimate partner primary source. And that can happen somewhere between six to 18 months into the relationship, sometimes less, sometimes a little bit longer. And this happens because either your fuel has become stale to us, and therefore we perceive that you've let us down, or if for some reason you've been rationing it, and that might be done inadvertently, you're not providing us with enough fuel frequently enough, thus you've let us down, or you start behaving in a way which threatens our control. So you are damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. You're always going to end up being devalued. And you enter a sustained devaluation. Now, at the beginning of the sustained devaluation, there's something called the stranger zone. This doesn't always appear with every dynamic. I have, again, a video about that, where essentially the narcissist isn't being horrible to you in the sense of beating you up or calling you bad names, but they seem to just become very withdrawn they're not that bothered about seeing you. They don't talk to you that much. They don't seem excited to see you any longer. The fizz that you're experiencing in the golden period has suddenly gone flat. So you're not being out and out abused at this juncture, but it's almost a sort of um, the wrong side of neutral. But as I say, that doesn't always happen. 
There's only certain instances. What does always happen is then further on in the sustained devaluation is that you get the abuses, which range dependent on the type of narcissist you're dealing with, from silent treatments, both absence and present, physical violence, sexual violence, having your money taken, being belittled, invalidated, subjected to word salads, triangulated with objects, triangulated with people, the narcissist cheating on you, the narcissist depriving you of sleep, the narcissist revising history, the narcissist gaslighting you, many different types of manipulations which are imposed upon you in order to control you and draw fuel from you. And that's done at this juncture because you are viewed as being a problem. You have let us down. You actually may not have done in your world, but in our world, you have. You then get the roller coaster of being devalued, and then you'll be granted a respite period. So the golden period comes back for a short period of time. And that cons the victim into thinking, oh, good, everything's OK. We can get back to that wonderful period again. It's worth hanging in there. I'm going to, I think I might have worked out what I need to do to get back to that. And then you get devalued again. Oh, no, it's gone wrong, but I'm not going to leave because I got the golden period back, so I can do it again. Actually, you didn't. The narcissist just imposed it for their own reasons. And so you get that roller coaster. And then with this relationship, there are three potential outcomes. Either you escape because you've had enough, or more commonly, the narcissist disengages from you. And there are five triggers for that, which you can learn about in my video, the five reasons the narcissist leaves you. Or neither of those things happen, and the roller coaster continues, devaluation, respite period, devaluation, respite period, until one of you dies. So that's the dynamic of the relationship between a narcissist and an intimate partner, both in terms of going down the route of intimate partner secondary source, which stays that way, the shelf dynamic, or where it transmutes into the one, which is the most traditional one, of being the intimate partner primary source, where your boyfriend and girlfriend, husband and wife, cohabs, that kind of thing. So that's the dynamic that takes place between narcissist and empath in a romantic setting. But remember, you'll have them in a familial setting as well. So that's a shelf dynamic, and you're a secondary source to the narcissist, non-intimate. Friends, colleagues, work environment, a neighborly environment. Again, all of those will be shelf dynamics, where the narcissist comes along, takes you off the shelf, interacts with you, largely will treat you well, then pop you back on the shelf again. If you get out of line, you'll be given corrective devaluations. In some instances, in those dynamics, there'll be a scapegoat that's assigned, a member of the family who's always painted black a colleague who's always painted black, a friend that's always painted black, that the narcissist always treats badly. Scapegoats don't always exist, but they do in certain instances. So there's lots of different dynamics. And one of the things that has set my work apart from many other commentators is the fact that I don't just talk about the standard seduction, devaluation, discard, I, I prefer disengagement, which other commentators just focus on there are so many different dynamics that exist and that's why my work proves to be so uh, incisive and insightful and helpful for people because i recall in the early days of my consultations it's going back over six years the school psychologist contacted me and she said i read other people's work and watched their videos and it didn't resonate with me and then i came across yours and the dynamic that you described of the shelf dynamic between intimate partner prime secondary source rather a narcissist, boom, the light bulb came on. That was exactly what I was experiencing and nobody else had talked about that. So it's very important to recognize there's all these different dynamics, which of course I deal with in my blog articles and also through products and the Knowledge Vault in my videos. This is, I have so many questions right now. This is incredible. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you can speak more about mirroring, but specifically mm -hmm. how can somebody tell if the mirror, if it's mirroring or if it's a genuine mm, similarity that you're experiencing with somebody, like how can you tell sincere uh, connection versus insincere mirroring? Well, mirroring is the act of behaving in a similar way to the person that you're dealing with. And all human beings do it because it's that kind of birds of a feather mentality and that human beings are naturally drawn to somebody that is similar to them because that intrinsically feels safe. Uh, that's why people stick to certain racial groups, why people stick to certain socioeconomic groups, because that familiarity feels safe to them. 
um, the lack of familiarity feels unsafe, even though it might not necessarily be the case. And so within those groupings, not only do you mirror in terms of the type of people that you tend to fraternize with, but also people mirror instinctively because it's a social activity that signals to the other person, hey, I'm like you, you can trust me. So mm -hmm. all human beings do it, but non-narcissists don't do it for nefarious reasons. They do it as part of the socializing aspect, uh, like apes grooming, picking the fleas off one another. Uh, it's done as a part of a ritual of bringing you closer together. Narcissists do it because we have no true self and we're chameleons. So what we are able to do is portray whatever we need to portray to the person that we're dealing with in order to draw them in. So if that individual needs to appear like a left-leaning social justice warrior, the narcissist could do that. If they need to appear like the corporate raider, they can do that. If they need to appear like the religious family man, they can do that because there's no central core to the narcissist. And so they can mirror the appearance, the gestures, the things that victim likes, the, the things that the victim doesn't like. Oh, Elton John's music. No, I can't stand him either. Uh, oh, you like Thai food? So do I. There's a brilliant Thai restaurant. And so the narcissist mirrors all of those things, either instinctively or where an aware narcissist consciously. And some narcissists will research their victims beforehand to ascertain what they like, for instance, looking at their social media profile, so that when they move in on that victim, they can go, do you know something? I was uh, just coming back from my stables the other day. The victim interrupts, excuse me for interrupting. You have a horse. Yeah, yeah, I do. And of course, the narcissist knows full well this person is an equestrian. And they drop that into the conversation because they're mirroring. They don't have a horse. They don't uh, have any stables. It's a lie. But it's done to draw that individual in. Now, you asked, how can you tell? Well, in some instances, when you're just talking like that, you can't. Because... The narcissist is designed to do it with a level of conviction to draw you in. That's why people say, but it seems so genuine. Well, apparent, naturally, it has to. If it doesn't seem genuine, it's not going to work. Now, some narcissists, their mirroring is a little bit cracked, and they sort of perhaps will stumble a little bit when they're talking about these things. So you get the impression it's not that genuine. So it might raise your suspicions. But what tends to happen is because empathic people are kind and compassionate, rather than say, well, I, don't, I don't think you're a commercial airline pilot at all. They give that person the benefit of the doubt because their emotional thinking is already rising. And rather than go, yeah, you're not a, you're not a pilot. They go, Mm, I'm not sure, but I won't say anything because I don't want to embarrass them. So they let it go, driven by their own emotional thinking. Mm. One way, a quick way of start, if finding out whether you, this is mirroring that's um, uh, being done by a narcissist is to actually ask some questions of that person about the topic that they proclaim to be interested in. Because with most narcissists, all you're getting is the icing. It's wafer thin. And they do enough to look like they know about this thing that they're talking about. Oh, yes, the works of William Shakespeare. Yes, Hamlet's my favourite play. Well, tell me, what's your favourite play? And then it, the focus is on you and you're talking and talking and everything is, yes, yes, I, I, I like The Merchant of Venice too. And if you were to replay the conversation, you realise the narcissist letting you talk about the subject and agreeing with you rather than doing much talking about the subject themselves. So the key to it is, if you have suspicions, is to ask some questions. Oh, you like Merchants of Venice too? Who's your favourite character? And then you'll probably get an answer. Oh, well, there's so many to choose from. I can't pick a favourite. There we are. Vagueness, which is often the refuge of the narcissist because they can't give you a specific character. No, 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 you must, ha you must have a favourite. Tell me one of them. Oh, honestly, you know, what, what, which is yours? Back to you, deflection. Mm. No, no, I, I know who my favourite is. I'm interested in who yours is. Please tell me. Um, oh, um, did you want another drink? I've just seen the waiter. 
triangulation with somebody else and you notice you're not getting an answer. Why? Because there isn't one, because he doesn't know, because he's never seen it. He's just mirroring you. So you can start to ask some questions. And of course, if you're a specialist in that area, you can ask some quite probing questions and you don't have to cross-examine that individual so as to make your uncle. And of course, if that person is genuine in their life, then they're not going to be offended by you asking some questions in the way that you have just done so. The only instance where that won't work is where you're dealing with a particularly skilled narcissist who is able to, has conducted some research, so recognises, for instance, that you like Shakespeare, so has boned up on some Shakespeare beforehand, and is able, to, so knows a handful of characters from Merchant of Venice, and then would be able to select one, and then would actually, if you ask why, they've got sufficient uh, level of intellect and they're articulate enough to tell you about why it is with a degree of conviction. The fact is though, those types of narcissists are comparatively rare. The chances are you'll be dealing with a lower grade one where asking those questions will result in them exposing that they don't, there's nothing beneath the surface of what they're mirroring you about. So, and in some instances, it might even cause them to blow up. What are you asking me all these questions for? And that's because their narcissism hasn't been able to deal with your questioning because it's repeatedly threatening their sense of control. And then you realize, oh, well, this person's blown up on this second date. That's not very encouraging. Or more usually, you get a lot of bluster and non-answering going on and deflection. And then there's a red flag. Remember, you can't just determine that somebody's a narcissist from that one interaction alone. You need to look at behavior over a course of time. But if you're dealing with that person and that red flag pops up, there'll be other ones. And at that early juncture, you then need to think very carefully about whether you continue to involve yourself with this person. Mm. You can't necessarily say that they're a narcissist. They may well be, but there are sufficient red flags to say better to back off. Now, can you speak a little bit as to the way in which narcissists um, I think I've heard you say that it's rather instinctual, the way in which they will kind of like target an empath and the mm -hmm. the way in which they're able to kind of like find their weaknesses to use it against them. Can you speak to mm -hmm. that? In essence, it's almost like we sniff out empaths, but in reality, what's happening is aware narcissists are able to see certain behaviors and recognize that they're dealing with an empath but also at an instinctive level as well. And most narcissists do it instinctively as a way that the narcissist has evolved. So in the same way, uh, an animal is able to sniff out its prey and recognize that that's the scent of a gazelle. So I'm gonna go over there and hunt it down. Um, and that the lioness recognizes there are certain areas where gazelles are likely to be found. It doesn't sit and think to itself, hmm, now, I wonder where I'll find the gazelles today. Well, they tend to congregate in areas where there's a clean water source, and therefore, I think I'll wander down to there and find one. It's, it's part of the DNA of that lioness to understand instinctively where gazelle congregate and be able to sniff them out and therefore go after that prey. And it's similar with the narcissist. We have been created in order to achieve the prime aims, fuel control, character traits, and residual benefits, which we can get from any human being, but empaths serve our needs the best. And therefore, the narcissist has evolved to pick out an empath by instinctively recognizing the way that that person behaves that signals that they're an empath, which then means because they've got the addiction to the narcissist, they are easier to ensnare and easier to keep ensnared. So there's certain behaviors, there's certain mannerisms, there's certain things that are said, there's certain things that are done. And I set all of this out in my book, Sitting Target, which goes into considerable detail. So to help people understand how that works, both in terms of a calculated response and an instinctive response, I'd encourage people to read that book because it's very detailed and explains to you all the ins and outs of why we go after our targets in the way that we do. Now, I'm curious, whoops, sorry, I just kicked my tripod there. I'm curious about the, um, within 
I'm curious about this. Would you agree that perhaps with younger empaths, it's a lot easier for a narcissist to ensnare them, but how will a narcissist navigate that as perhaps their demographic is getting older and perhaps the empaths are getting a little bit more savvy, how that will impact their approach in trying to target an empath? Or does it not even matter because an empath is an empath, it's irrespective of the age? Yeah, an empath is an empath. We seek the uh, empathic traits, class traits, and special traits, which again are detailed in my book, Sitting Target. And so an empath that's 20 years old or an empath that's 40 years old, both will serve our purposes. However, it might be that the narcissist has a particular preference to the younger narcissist, uh, I beg your pardon, younger empath, because as a consequence of youth, everything's in the right place, shall we say. And that, that, that particular narcissist regards a younger empath as more beautiful than the older empath. Of course, it can work the other way around, that there are narcissists that would prefer an older empath because they think that they're more beautiful and they might see them as more established in terms of asset ownership and wealth and connections. And so just because somebody is older, and just because someone is of a particular intelligence, that doesn't actually necessarily mean that they're going to be savvy when it comes to dealing with us. Because whilst you might think, OK, somebody who doesn't have much experience of the world, they are going to be very easy to ensnare. Yes, as a general proposition that holds up. But just because somebody has been around the block a few times doesn't necessarily mean that they are immediately going to pick up on the narcissist and escape. There are many people who... I deal with who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, who've entered ensnarements. So being a bit long in the tooth and also being intelligent and no defense, what you have to do is know what to look for and lower your emotional thinking so that you apply logic in your dealings with people so that you're more likely to pick out the narcissist at an early jun earlier juncture. There are, of course, some people that do become savvy to the ways of the narcissist. Nobody, nobody knows about us first time around. So many people don't, haven't really heard about narcissism. And then there are those that just basically think, oh, yeah, narcissist. Oh, that's somebody who loves themselves. It's a bloke who's vain and, you know, he's a bit of a Lothario and he, he's always talking about himself. That's what that, that's a narcissist, isn't it? And of course, there's far more to it than that. And it's only when people start to understand narcissism ensnared in some shape or form. Some people never find out about it and spend their entire lives in the grip of narcissists. Some find out after decades worth of abuse. Some people find out sooner. Um, it might be that they recognize something is wrong and they go to uh, Mr. Google and tap in, why doesn't he respond to my text messages? And that eventually leads them down the path to learning about narcissism. Or they've got a friend that says, I think you might be dealing with a narcissist because, and that friend knows about it because they've dealt with one previously. For the narcissist, the modus operandi remains the same in terms of seducing that individual using a variety of different manipulations. Because even when we're being nice to you, we're manipulating you. Whenever we are interacting with another human being, we're manipulating because it isn't a genuine interaction. It's only being done to get the prime aims. So you are being manipulated in the course of this conversation. You don't feel manipulated, but it has to stand up to logic that that's what's happening because I'm interacting with you. I need to be able to control you, not in a way that causes you any particular problem, but for instance, if you kept talking over me, I would need to take action to nullify that particular threat to control that's being caused by you keep talking over me. Or if you were saying, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, HG Tudor, you're an idiot, that would threaten my control. So I'd need to nullify it. As it is, you're politely asking me questions and listening to my answers. So there's no issue with control. So I have that. I'm receiving fuel from you when you're listening to me and when you're asking me questions. So that's the second prime aim. I'm not acquiring any character traits from you. And the residual benefit of this is that there will be a video created that will then allow other people to access my work, extending my legacy. So in my interaction with you, Faye, 
three of the prime aims are being dealt with. Now, the good news for you is you don't sit there and think, oh, I feel violated and manipulated by this man. You also get something out of it because you have a video which you can use. So there's a win-win. So there are, of course, interactions with the narcissist which essentially are favorable for you. Um, but if this was a different scenario, it might be that I would be seeking to seduce you and draw you in and pull you into a relationship with me. And, we, and as I explained earlier, we all know where that ends up. And then, of course, that's far more dangerous for you. With your accent, it wouldn't be hard, I don't think. <laughs> thank, thank you for providing me with that little bit of information. Yeah. Truly logged and noted. <laughs> I think Americans, we, at, at least this American, I have a thing for accents. And, mm -hmm. um, okay, so here's a question. What are some red flags that you can speak of that an empath could perhaps look for that would arm us mm -hmm. in being more savvy to your kind? Okay. So in the first dealings with an individual, watch out for vague answers, as I made mention of earlier on. Watch out for someone who repeatedly uh, pours scorn on previous relationships, their exes. Now, most people have had previous relationships, and sometimes they're not good ones. But with many people, yeah, you know, we had a nice time and it didn't quite work out. There we are. And of course, there are individuals who perhaps have been involved with narcissists and had a horrendous time. But the point is, is that you don't start talking about it in great detail. So everybody at, at some point might say, so, you know, have you been single long kind of thing? And yeah, I've been single six months, you know, last relationship didn't, you know, we, 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 we just grew apart. Oh, right. Okay. There we are. That's fine. But a narcissist is more likely to say, yeah, um, I've been single, you know, a couple of weeks. You know, X is an absolute bitch. You know, she's this, she's that. So there's a red flag, both in terms of smearing that X and also the fact that they're very quickly out there on the dating scene after the demise of a relationship. So there's two red flags. Somebody that's excessively complimentary and flattering you, that's a red flag. Somebody that is invading your privacy. So for instance, lots of incessant messaging, lengthy telephone calls, monopolizing your time, turning up at places unexpectedly. That might seem like a lovely surprise, but actually it's somewhat sinister. So if you suddenly find that this person keeps popping up to your workplace or that they turn up at your gym or somehow they've managed to find out where you are on a night out and just happen to be there. Oh, it's just passing. No, they weren't. They perhaps looked on your social media profile and realized where you are and decided to pop along as part of trying to control you. Those are red flags. Uh, mm, vagueness about family relationships. That's another red flag. Yeah, yeah, I don't really have that much to do with my mother and sort of dismissive about it. Um, remember, red flags can appear with non-narcissists as well. They're just not as numerous. So... Mm -hmm. Let's say, for instance, you go on a date and the man is excessively polite. He's always going, are you okay? Can I get you anything? He's uh, opening the car door for you. He opens all the doors for you. You know, he takes off his coat and throws it down on the puddle for you to walk across, that kind of thing. And you think, oh, it's lovely and chivalrous, this chap, but it's a little bit over the top. That's a red flag. But if there aren't any other ones, he's not a narcissist and he's just excessively polite. Mm -hmm. But if there are other red flags around it at that early juncture, you would do well to back away. So those are just some of the red flags that can be seen in the early stages of a narcissist seducing you. And unsurprisingly, I have a book called Red Flag, which details 50 of them. So those who are watching could access that to learn more about those red flags. I also have a product called Early Warning Detector, which details certain questions that you could ask of somebody and tells you what to look out for in terms of their answers, which would alert you to the fact that you may well be dealing with a narcissist. Wow. Okay, that's amazing. I'm gonna, as much as I think I know about the work that you've done, there's clearly a lot more that I can actually be discovering. So mm -hmm. I'm really, really glad that we're having this discussion so I can discover more of it. Now, mm -hmm. I do have a couple of um, specific questions that I would like to ask of you that is both from myself as well as um, from some of the subs that I have on my um, account, which yes. is 
are nurse I think you kind of answered this, which is are narcissists aware of what they are? But I, I believe you mm -hmm. answered that. If there's anything else that you want to add to that? Uh, simply, the vast majority of narcissists are unaware, and therefore that means that for most people, that if they're going to come across a narcissist, they're likely to be unaware. Many people struggle with understanding that the narcissist is unaware of what they are. It doesn't mean that they don't know what they're doing. It means that they don't know that they're a narcissist and they don't know that they're pursuing the prime aims. So they'll know that they, they've been nasty to you, but their justification for it is that you've done something to deserve it, which often hasn't occurred or is based on a half-truth. And I have plenty of material which helps people understand why narcissists behave as they do in relation to the unaware ones. Many people mistakenly think, oh, I'm dealing with a greater narcissist. Yeah, he, he, she knows exactly what they're doing. I explain, no, because they're, they are very rare. And actually, most narcissists are unaware. They have to be unaware because what happens has to happen quickly. So, for instance, if I poked a sharp stick towards your eye, Faye, you would not do this. Oh, HG's poking a sharp stick towards my eye. That could blind me. I'd better do something about it. So what I'll do is I'll try and knock the stick away and I'll jerk my head backwards. Because if you had to think about it, too late. I've already jabbed you in the eye. So you have to have a sharp response. Similarly with the narcissism. If the narcissist had to go, ah, in this conversation, my girlfriend is threatening my sense of control. I therefore need to nullify this threat to control. How shall I go about it? Which manipulation shall I use? Mm, mm, oh, I know, I'll use this one, and I'll do it like this. The threat to control has gone on for far too long, and it's causing huge damage to that narcissist. So he needs to be able to respond far quicker. So that's why most narcissists are unaware, because quite simply, they don't have the tools and the presence of mind and the speed of thought to implement the manipulation to get that fuel and control promptly. So the narcissism, in effect, does it like an autopilot for them. Certain narcissists don't actually realise what they've done at all. Why are you crying? You've just been nasty to me. No, I wasn't. And they, and they are genuine in that, that they don't see what they've done. Other narcissists know, oh, yeah, the reason I'm not talking to you is because you're always nagging me. So they know they're not talking to you, but they don't know that they're doing it for control. They don't know that they're doing it for fuel. They believe it's because you have been nagging them, and that's what's motivated them to respond in that way. Wow. <laughs> this it's just so unbelievable to hear it from the first person perspective of this. It just it's mm -hmm. it really is explained in a completely different way. Um, I'm also curious, this was a question from one of my other subs as well which are narcissists born or created? Narcissists are created. There has to be a genetic predisposition, namely parent or a grandparent or a great grandparent is a narcissist and that genetic seed has been passed on. And that has to be allied with a lack of control environment. Lack of control environment, and this happens in childhood, might be physical abuse, sexual abuse, being neglected, no emotional support, what I call grade B syndrome, where what you do isn't good enough. You scored two goals, why did you not score three? You scored 70% on your examination, why didn't you get 80%? So you climb a hill and there's always another hill behind it. Sometimes it's a gilded environment where the child is given everything, that everything's on a silver platter for them. There's lots of different lack of control environments. And you have to have those two things that come together. And that's what creates the narcissist. So they're not born, they are created. And if people watch my video, what makes a narcissist? I go into considerable detail about that very topic. So here's another question, which is, if there is perhaps multiple narcissists in a family, but they would be of a different kind. So this mm -hmm. is, not the terminology or the way that you would categorize them, but let's say, for example, the notion of a grandiose 
uh, narcissist's parent, and then they end up having a, a vulnerable, and again, understanding these are not the classifications you would use, mm -hmm. but they would create a vulnerable child. So how, how would that work exactly? What do you mean? How would they be created or how would the dynamic work between them? More as to why there would be different kinds of narcissists in one family. There'd be different kinds of narcissists in the family because you'll have different genetic flavors to begin with. In the same way, why do some people have blue eyes, green eyes, brown eyes? Then that's because someone else in the family has that to begin with. And then perhaps when it merges with somebody else, it creates a different outcome. So you can have different narcissists within the family because they are, there are different genetic influences to begin with, and also the environment within which they're created. So whilst you talk about grandiose and vulnerable, and as you acknowledge, I don't use those terms uh, as I find them unhelpful. So utilizing my terminology, you might say, why is there an upper mid ranger who then has a middle middle range A as a child, uh, who's, a, uh, who's the child's narcissist? May well be the case, for example, that that upper mid range narcissist, they're haughty and dismissive and they operate through superior, superiority. I'm in charge of this household. You do what I tell you, okay? And so what happens is, that that child gets the genetic predisposition from that parent and the way that they respond to dealing with the abuse their narcissism is created by causing them to be overly helpful to other people which on the face of it might be seen to be empathic but isn't because it's being done for their own purposes so what they do is in order to assert control they help other members of the family against the way that that narcissist is behaving. So those other members of the family are brought under control of the middle, middle range type A narcissist, the child. And so their narcissism goes in the direction of being the overwhelming angel as a consequence of compensating for the more, super, more uh, brusque, dismissive approach of the parental narcissist. So their narcissism, if you will, grows in that direction as a means of negating the threat to control. In some instances, it might be that the parental narcissist might be a middle, middle range type B victim narcissist. And therefore that child ends up having to parent the parent, but, but becomes a narcissist themselves because they're starved of, they don't have any choice in their own childhood but to look after their parent and again that could create them as being a middle middle range type a being overly helpful or they might be contemptuous of the weakness of the parent so it causes them to bully their parent you're useless you don't do things right you don't, you've never looked after me properly and they become an upper lesser type b so the direction if i could describe it that their narcissism grows in will be influenced by the genetic aspect but also the environment in which they find themselves which causes it to go in a particular direction so that's why you can end up with different narcissists you of course can end up with the apple doesn't fall far from the tree and you can end up with similar narcissists because they replicate the behaviors so for instance father is let's say uh upper lesser type a very popular the affable asshole always running around having affairs the son sees that uh, monkey see monkey do and his narcissism he's got the genetic predisposition for dad he hasn't got a supportive environment because he's got a terrible role model as a father uh, but he sees that that's successful that his dad is liked by lots of people but friendships are there just to be utilized for whatever's needed and Joe is chasing women around so the son replicates that behavior and becomes an upper lesser type A himself mm. I'm, I'm really glad this is being recorded because I'm going to have to go back and watch that. That was an incredible, sure. incredible response. Thank you for that. Um, You're welcome. What is some ways that, um, I'm going to save that for the end. Hold on. Okay, so can a narcissist, once they have been, they've come to the understanding that they are one, can they be mm -hmm. righted, so to say? 
or once you are one, that's it, you are one? Well, if you're an aware narcissist, you know what you are and therefore see no reason to be cured, healed, changed. An unaware narcissist will never become an aware narcissist, can never be persuaded to understand what they are, and therefore will always reject any attempt to change them. Anybody that comes along and says, I'm a cured narcissist, was either not a narcissist to begin with and they were mistaken, or they are a narcissist and they're lying. And that lie is a form of manipulation. So I know that there are certain narcissists that exist in cyberspace operating TikTok accounts, claiming that I am a cured narcissist, I've been working on myself, you know, I'm becoming a better person. Bullshit. They are just manipulating their audience and they are being misled by their own narcissism. They do genuinely believe that they've been fixed, but they can't be because they're a narcissist. Mm. And therefore they're misleading their audiences and giving people hope that the narcissist can change. Let me make it very clear. The narcissist will not change. And that's why you must always obey the principle of go so. Get out, stay out. Once you know, you go. Yeah, that was one of the questions that I had, if you could speak more about go so. So I think mm -hmm. um, that's a very, very helpful principle. If you can speak any more as to that. If you suspect that a person is a narcissist or, for instance, you are you're in a relationship and you're not happy, then you need to examine what is behind that. Now, of course, some relationships don't work because the people just aren't compatible. There's no abuse going on. You're just not meant to be together. There's no narcissist involved there. In some relationships, they become a bit stale because you're used to one another, but nobody's really abusing one another. You might not be happy about your relationship, but you're not being abused. There's no narcissist there. If you find yourself being subjected to some of the manipulations that I've mentioned, and you can learn more about them in Black Flag and Manipulated, two of my books, then you look at that and think, I may well be being, I, I'm being abused, therefore I may well be involved with the narcissist. So first of all, you have to be alive to the fact that you're being abused, or if with some serendipity, you look at some of the red flags and you're in the early stages where you're not being traditionally abused and you might think yeah this person's ringing me up a lot they're buying me presents when it's not my birthday they're coming around all of the time he's always slagging off his ex-wife mm, some red flags there if you have a suspicion based upon red flags or black flags or the manipulations or the abuse that you uh, are experiencing then i'd encourage you to utilize my narc detector where you answer lots of questions from a questionnaire. I analyze that using my expertise and tell you whether you're dealing with a narcissist or not. And if you are, I tell you which type you're dealing with. And I tell you the reasons why they're a narcissist. And I give you the reasons why they are of the school and cadre. You are now fixed with the knowledge that you're dealing with a narcissist. That means you ought to obey the first golden rule of freedom. Once you know, you go, you get out and you stay out. And that means you implement a total no contact regime and you stick to it utilizing the materials that I will provide you with. In some instances, many people think I can't do no contact because often that's emotional thinking because your addiction to the narcissist doesn't want you walking away from the narcissist. It wants you staying. So it causes you to think that you can't leave. I can't go. I haven't got anywhere to live. Go and, st go and stay on somebody's sofa. Stay in your car. Better than being abused. And you'll eventually be able to sort somewhere out to stay. Go and stay with a friend. Um, go and stay with family. I, I can't I can't leave because I haven't got any money. Go, go and see an attorney and, and look at getting spousal support, child maintenance, etc. I can't leave because of the children. Well, you can. Uh, you can take them with you. Or you might be able to seek an injunction that has the narcissist removed from your house. So in many instances, people think that they can't remove themselves. Uh, and getting themselves in a position of no contact, but it's actually their emotional thinking, seizing on some perceived practical difficulty. Sometimes it t focuses on an emotional issue. I feel guilty leaving him. You have to ask yourself, why on earth would you feel guilty for leaving an abuser? That's not logical. So you have to remind yourself that it is the logical thing to do and that your feeling is misleading you. I had a client 
a few months ago in consultation, she said to me, Faye, I, I'm really sad. And she was crying. I said, why are you crying? She said, well, I wouldn't expect you to understand that. You're a heartless, narcissistic psychopath. And I said, no, I understand it. I want to see if you understand why you're crying. I said, well, I'm crying because he's died. And I said, why? I said, I've got thousands of clients who give their eye teeth to be in the position that you're in. They'd love their narcissist go under reverse. I said, yours is an emotional reaction, which isn't logical. And you need to recognize that. So when you're fixed with the knowledge that you're dealing with a narcissist, you then need to recognize that your addiction to the narcissist will try and get in the way and stop, try and stop you from leaving, as will the narcissist, of course, if the narcissist senses that you are becoming more difficult to control or that you're thinking about leaving. And then once you're out, you then need to ensure that you stay out. And so my work and the range of materials and my consultations will help you get over the line in terms of leaving and then staying out. And even where you think that you can't impose a no contact regime, and I surprise many people by demonstrating actually that you can. And the testimonials as to my work speak for themselves. I'm curious if you think the emotional thinking is why it takes victims of uh, narcissistic abuse so many tries to get out for good. It is. Or they'll leave and they'll come it, back. They'll leave and they'll come back. Yeah. Well, if you think about it logically, this person is abusing you. Okay. They're hurting you. They're beating you up. They're raping you. They're stealing your money. They're belittling you. They never let you go anywhere. They're always looking through your phone. Whatever form the abuses take. Why would you put, keep putting up with that? You wouldn't. And how many times do you see people comment? They perhaps read a news article. Victim of domestic violence, beaten up 20 times before she left. Oh, I'd have left the first time he hit me. I'd have left the first time he'd hit me. Man raises his hands to me, I'm out of there. So why does she not leave? Does she like being beaten up? Of course she doesn't. The reason is that something is interfering with the decision-making process that's keeping her there. Sometimes it is, I feel that I need to stay for the sake of the children. Mm. So it's, it's, on the face of it, that seems logical, but it's not. Because you are no good to your children if they are witnessing you being beaten up or the next day wondering why mummy has got a black eye. You need to get out. And thinking that you need to stay for the sake of the children is emotional thinking. So what emotional thinking does is it poses a triple threat. It creates flawed logic. It corrupts certain of your traits to keep you interacting with the narcissist. And it makes you feel a particular way. Sometimes it makes you feel sorry for the narcissist. He can't help what he does. He needs help. No, no help is going to, help is not going to change him. But of course, what happens is, except in a few isolated incidents, most narcissists are lovely to you to begin with, and then it goes wrong. And what people do mistakenly is they think this. This person was wonderful to me, and then it went wrong. That shows that they can be delightful and kind and wonderful. I want to get back to that. What they don't realize is this. If a person is abusing you, what came first wasn't genuine. Because if it was genuine, you wouldn't be abused. And so if you're being abused, that golden period that you experienced was manufactured because people who are genuine in the way that they care and love for you will not abuse you. Yes, once in a while, they might snap at you because they're tired. Yes, once in a while, they might have a bit of go at you because you didn't take the trash out. That's not abuse. That's just the rubbing up against one another in the relationship between two independent people. But where you are being repeatedly abused over a sustained period of time, that part where it was all wonderful was an illusion generated to draw you in. Because if we are red of tooth and claw all of the time, we wouldn't have any victims. So what we have to do is create this illusion, mirror you, seem like we've been sent from heaven, seem like we're your soulmate, and you get drawn in. And your emotional thinking goes off the charts. You miss all of the red flags, and we've got you. And then we abuse you. And rather than you walk away at the first instance of abuse, as you should do, you think to yourself, why has it gone wrong? Have I done something wrong? Have I brought this on myself? Because he was so lovely. It must be me. How can we get back to where we once were? Because it was so wonderful. And I don't want to lose all of that. And all of that is emotional thinking. This, I'm assuming, is not 
the threshold is going to be different for a non-empath, for a normal. Would a normal be more yes. likely to leave after the first incident of abuse? Indeed. So normals are harder to ensnare. They can be ensnared. But for instance, the normal is more likely to do this. Jesus, this guy's blowing up my phone. This is too much. It's over the top. I'm not bothering with him anymore. So she, that person may not recognize that that individual is a narcissist. They just recognize that his, his or hers repeatedly intrusive messaging is too much. It's coming on too much. I feel smothered. So they'll back away because they don't have the addiction that is trying to keep them involved with the narcissist. So they don't suffer from the emotional thinking. If they have been ensnared, when they start to get abused, it's like, nobody, nobody treats me that way. I'm out. I'm not putting up with this. I'm out. So they are more likely to remove themselves from the relationship because they don't have emotional thinking clouding their judgment, causing things like, I feel guilty, or this person's evidently in pain. I'm obliged to help them get through their difficulties and see if I can heal them or fix them. Or love will conquer anything. And it's just an aberration. 75% of the time, he's wonderful. What this actually just came to my mind. I think I had seen this somewhere on your page. You spoke about um, an empath supernova. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, there is a, unsurprisingly, there is a video about that and a blog article which goes into greater detail. Where somebody is a super empath, either a majority super empath or minority super empath, they have the capacity to experience what's called the empathic supernova whereby certain behavior towards them triggers a response where they explode, not necessarily in a way of going berserk and fighting the narcissist, but rather they draw a line in the sand and say enough. And it causes them to fight back, to punch an escape route for them. It might be an escape route from the relationship as a whole or an escape route from that particular situation that they find themselves in. So the super empath, is less likely to put up with the behaviors for as long as other types of empaths. And with that supernova, there's a form of fighting back, not in the sense of necessarily going after the narcissist, but it's more a defensive maneuver. So the super empath doesn't go around parking their tanks on other people's lawns. But when the narcissist parks too many tanks on their lawn at an early juncture, rather than go, ooh, there's lots of tanks parked on my lawn, I better facilitate that and pussyfoot around the narcissist. It's no way, Jose, I'm not putting up with this any longer. Those tanks need to be moved or I'm out. And there's a form of resilient, a resistance to the narcissist through that supernova. So it's not turning into some kind of kick-ass uh, ninja empath that immediately goes, hi -ya! and karate chops the uh, narcissist into submission. It's used in a more defensive way to protect the super empath so that they can remove themselves from either the situation or the relationship. Thank you for that. I have just a few more questions. Um, mm -hmm. And while I'm kind of looking it over, I just want to say for anybody who's watching this, that not only does HD understand the dynamic of the narcissist, but he also has an insane amount of information and understanding about empaths. So if you think you are one, um, and you want to understand why you've been ensnared, there's an unbelievable amount of information that you can actually discover there as well. Um, is okay. So here's a question: Is it true that narcissists only feel rage and jealousy? No, narcissists will feel a variety of emotions, some of which are genuine and some of which are manufactured. So, our genuine emotions: are hatred, antipathy, jealousy, envy, infatuation. Um, that's some of them. Uh, the fury that's ignited. Um, manufactured emotions are caused by the narcissism making the narcissist believe they feel that way in order to compel them to seek the prime aims so an obvious example is causing the narcissist to believe that he's in love with somebody now we don't actually love anybody because we have no emotional empathy and the narcissist believes that they love somebody because then that compels them to go after that person with all of the sort of trappings of romantic love, all of the shiny, sparkly stuff, rather than the genuine stuff. And that's all of this, that all gets the attention of the empath. So what you have is that the narcissism will cause the narcissist to feel a particular way, 
and think in a particular way. Some of those feelings will be genuine and some of them it's more they actually think that way rather than it being a feeling. So the narcissist believes that he's in love, so he thinks he's in love, but it's actually infatuation. He's feeling infatuation. The narcissist feels envy, so and it compels him, therefore, to take certain steps. In the same way, you feel uh, an uncomfortable sensation in your throat. It's dry, it's uncomfortable. You recognize that as thirst, so you go and get a drink. You're becoming dehydrated. Your body, to defend itself, reminds you that you're becoming dehydrated and therefore you ought, to have a, you ought to have a drink. So it makes you feel uncomfortable and you understand what that means. So you go off and get some water. Your stomach's rumbling, you feel lightheaded, you're hungry. So again, in order to protect you, your body makes you feel a particular way and think a particular way. Similarly, you are frightened of something. So it causes you either to fight or run away again, to protect you. Narcissists experience fear, psychopaths don't. Narcissists experience anxiety, which can compel them to act in a particular way. Narcissists don't feel sad, although they believe that they do. Narcissists don't feel happy, although they believe that they do. So there are more emotions than people realize, because many people think, oh, narcissists don't have any emotions. Narcissists do have emotions, and they're there to compel the narcissist to seek the prime aims but it's a, it's a more muted emotional spectrum compared to a non-narcissist. That's very interesting. I did not expect that answer. Um, I'm okay. curious why, as a narcissist, um, why you are choosing to do this, why you are sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, your information with everybody? Oh, first of all, it's great being me, and I want people to know about that. Furthermore, there's a lot of gaps in the information that's out there and misinformation about narcissism and psychopathy. Uh, I find that offensive, and it threatens my sense of control, so I wish to correct it. But the main overriding reason is the creation of a legacy. And the fact is that at some point, I'm going to die. It's a long way off but it will happen. And that is a threat to my control. Mm. It's the greatest threat to my control that exists. And therefore, when the Grim Reaper appears with his adamantine scythe and says, okay, it's your turn, I can look him in the eye as a steely-eyed dealer of death myself and say to him, fine, time to go. And I'll have the knowledge at that point that my work will live on after my demise that there will continue to be the books, the videos, the blogs, articles. Who knows? By that stage, I may even set it up that somebody runs it for me after I go, that, they, that I've taught people about my work and that there are various Tudorites and a Tudor Academy. Who knows? Or that simply the fact that what I've created already continues to persist and I have that knowledge. And so people say to me, but it's under a pseudonym. So how will that work? It's very easy. I know that's me. It doesn't need to be my real name. Let's say I'm called John Smith. I'm not. I don't need people to know about John Smith. If I was on the tube in London and I saw somebody reading an H.G. Tudor book, I know that's me. Therefore, my legacy is there in front of me. I don't need that person to know that they're sat opposite me. Indeed, it would amuse me to have them uh, not realise that the author is sat directly opposite them. That would entertain me. But the point is, I create this legacy so that at the, when I know that that's it, I'm on my way, way out, I know that my work will live on and thus I have negated that threat to control. Mm -hmm. I don't do this because I'm kind and caring, because as you know, I've got no emotional empathy. I also do this because I find the subject intellectually stimulating. I like solving problems. So when people come along and they've got an issue, I like to unpick it and provide them with a solution, which demonstrates my magnificence, draws fuel from their response. Uh, of course, I make money from doing this as well, which is a residual benefit. Um, it enables me to flex my uh, creative side as well. So it's I do it because there's a variety of reasons, and they're all basically because it's uh, factors 
that are good for me. I don't do it because I like helping people. I don't do it because I'm kind, because I've got no emotional empathy. I like winning. And so if somebody wins by escaping a narcissist, that's my win, character trait acquisition. And I find it entertaining to empower and weaponize empaths to go into battle against narcissists all across the globe. My work has spanned the globe. I think there's only five countries where my books haven't been read, that my work hasn't been accessed. There's all these people that are fighting against their narcissists by getting away. That's power. N understanding that my reach, and there's still so much more to do. There's so much more information for me to convey, so many more topics to uh, dissect. But it accords with what I am and gives me so much from what I've explained. And therefore, why not do it? I am the expert. Why not show off my expertise? There is oh, there is so much in that. I, I think the most interesting, um, from an outsider, the, the one of the most interesting things is that you're not doing it from like the goodness of your heart. It's not because you're compassionate, but it really does serve the prime aims. And I think that really demonstrates mm -hmm. the nature of a narcissist really, really succinctly. Absolutely. You see, there are other providers of information, some who are victims and they want to help other people. That's understandable. But actually, you're not going to say anything new that hasn't been said before. You're not going to provide any uh, unique insights. And you're actually hindering your own recovery because you're staying mired in the very subject which has caused a problem for you. Then there are the professionals who obviously have something to add. They've studied the subject. They bring some value. But they don't necessarily know it all. And often, because they've not experienced it themselves, they have a gap in their knowledge. So they don't provide you with everything that you need. Then, of course, you get individuals who come along and believe that they're experts. And there's actually quite a lot of these who are unaware narcissists who create YouTube channels and blogs, believing that they were a victim and they weren't. In actual fact, they were the perpetrator and they don't realize it because their narcissism is blinding them to it. And they cause a problem because they believe that they care and of course, they have cognitive empathy, so they're able to create the impression of caring. But the problem that is generated is this. They are providing a perspective to people who believe that they are a victim when actually they were the perpetrator. And so what they end up doing is skewed with their narcissistic perspective. They feed into non-narcissist understanding of narcissism untruths. So, for instance, that unaware narcissist, in order to assert control over his audience, needs to portray himself as a victim of a particularly cruel and venal narcissist that has pursued him to the ends of the earth. Most narcissists won't do that because it's quite simply not in their interest to behave that way. And what's actually happening is none of that actually happened or part of it happened because a genuine victim fought back. So that unaware narcissist starts telling you, oh, every single narcissist wants to destroy you. Not true. Why destroy something that serves a purpose for us? Better to keep it just about alive rather than completely crushing it. And so those individuals, they think they're empaths. And what they do is they pump out a whole load of misinformation to people who don't realize that they're dealing with an unaware narcissist. And there are quite a lot of them, actually. And that's why I explain to people I'm honest about what I am. And that's why I operate under a pseudonym so that I can tell you all of this because I can't tell you all of this under my real name because of the problems it would cause for me. Mm. So by using a pseudonym and protecting my identity, I then have the freedom because it doesn't affect my control to tell you warts and all about my world and that of my kind and understanding how we look at all of you and how we view you and what we want to do to you and how we ensnare you. And all of that's done unvarnished without being sugarcoated and gives you exactly the information that you need. And I'm upfront about what I am. Yeah. 
This last question I have mm -hmm. is more out of curiosity, and it's I'm, it's going to come on this, which is I'm going to recommend to everybody that's watching this to go watch. <laughs> this is just one of the many amazing videos that HD has done on his YouTube channel, but on Harry's wife, and it's all about Meghan Markle. <laughs> I am curious why you you don't call her Meghan; you call her Harry's wife. Because that's all. That's the only reason that we know about her. Because she married the ginger, and she, much as though she would like everyone to think that they, the world knew about her because she was in suits, most people had never heard of it or her. I only knew about her as a consequence of her involvement with Prince Harry, and therefore, as part of my assertion of control over her, by not referring to her in her by her full name, and also. In part, it uh, denies her part of sort of the algorithm by not making mention of her name in a full way. And it amuses my viewers that I refer to her that way. And it's the contempt contemptuous manner by which you'd expect me to behave. I, I do it primarily because it's entirely accurate. The only reason that we know about her is because she is Harry's wife. We don't know her in her own right. And the only reason that she continues to be known is that she is the wife of a prince. And so it's a stark reminder for her of the way that she's seen. And I know many other people, you know, they refer to her as the wife. Uh, mm. Because once again, that's how she's got to where she has. And that's demonstrated through her history. She's only ever achieved stuff as a consequence of leeching off men. Her father, her first or second, depending on who you ask, husband. Trevor, Trevor, Trevor to Trev, Trev, as she would call him, and now Prince Harry, and then other boyfriends and so forth. She ensnares them, sucks the benefits out of them, and then disengages and moves on. Mm. She's no talent of her own. She's a mediocre actress, can't write, can't sing, can't dance. We get eaten alive in a political environment. She's got no business savvy. And so she's only got where she's got through basically bringing in a man who pays for a tuition, pays for a standard of living, then the next one supports, provides some support financially and then enables her to get auditions and so forth. And then onto the next one, catapults her onto the worldwide stage as a consequence of who he is with access to networks and wealth. Would you be interested in giving us a prediction on what you think is going to uh, transpire between those two, if she's going to discard him, if he's going to leave her, when you think this might be, anything of that nature? Well, it won't surprise you, Faye, to know that I've already covered that in one of my videos about Harry's wife. Um, but brief, So I'd encourage people to go and watch those. They're called Harry's Wife, The Future. So if you just search for H.G. Tudor, Harry's Wife, The Future, that should come up. And you'll be able to watch, I think there's four or five videos that go into detail about it. So if people want to go and watch those videos without any kind of spoiler, then cover your ears now, as I'm going to give you a brief, uh, a brief synopsis of what's likely to occur. Um, if you're not bothered about the spoilers, then you can continue listening. I see that she will disengage from him. She will get rid of him. Uh, because his his usefulness will come to an end in the not too distant future, and I anticipate that will occur in the next couple of years. Wow, I did not see that coming. Mm -hmm. He's not going to escape her because he's in the folly of deux with her. His emotional thinking is too high. There's nobody able to intervene because he's fallen prey to her manipulations and been ostracized from his family so there's nobody who can really pull him to one side and say look bro this is happening there's, he's got nobody to turn to and sort of say you know she treats me like this she treats me like that because he's lost lots of his friends the only friends he really seems to have are hers and, her, and she doesn't have that many herself she's also cultivated this idea of it's me and you against the world yeah. so he has to cling on tighter and tighter to her because without her, he hasn't really got anybody. He's got, he, he doesn't have a job, so he hasn't really got any colleagues, hasn't got any friends. He's been isolated from them. He's been taken to a country that isn't natural 
uh, for him to know its ways. I mean, it shows, you know, his observation of the First Amendment is bonkers. Um, he doesn't understand America. Um, he has been ostracized from his family. So there isn't the likelihood of an intervention because how's it going to happen? She successfully manipulated him in a way that he's uh, isolated from all of those other influences. Mm. The only way that it could happen is if that he went to something on his own and then the royal family decided this is when we'll strike. But invariably, she either stops him going or she accompanies him so she can keep him on a tight rein. So I don't see that he'll escape. There's a possibility that he'll break down, which means she'll get rid of him because he's of no use, or just generally she'll see that you're not as wealthy as I thought you would be. We've milked the connection as much as we can. And we've now, and particularly if Charles starts to say, titles are going, you're not getting any money, you aren't, you really want to be the private citizens, then the royal connection becomes meaningless. And then in order for her to get what she needs, she really has to go down the merchandising route or monetizing some kind of talent. Ooh, big problem there, she hasn't got any. So it would mean that she would have to ditch Harry and find somebody else with loads of money that she can leech off. And of course, there are rumors that she has been sniffing around Gordon Getty, a billionaire, uh, not necessarily perhaps to have a relationship with him, but to get some residual benefits from him. But it would not surprise me that ultimately, as a consequence of Harry no longer being of use for the reasons that I've explained, that she will then move on to finding somebody else and then ditch Harry. I thought maybe they had like 10 years before she was gonna leave him, but it's also like, where is she gonna go from him? Like what's what's the next rung up the ladder after you've, you know- Well, she's going, she's, she's going to try and find some, uh, I think she'll probably go down the Anna Nicole Smith route, try and find some mm -hmm. aged billionaire that she can throw some spicy poontang at and ensure that she gets some money out of, and then he pops his clogs and she inherits loads of money, and then she's made for life, and then she will just have a selection of intimate relationships thereafter, not based upon money, because she's got that huge residual benefit, which is massively important to her. And instead, she'll just do those relationships in order to control those people and draw fuel from them. The residual benefit of money won't be as important then, because she's already got some. Uh, money's hugely important to her, uh, it is often with many narcissists, particularly of a somatic and elite nature, but uh, it, it, and that proves to be the case with her. So I don't see that they've got 10 years. I might be mistaken, but I don't believe that I am. The fact is, already she's distancing herself from him. Remember, he's in the sustained devaluation as it is, and we can see with recent behaviour, she's not been as prominent. She let him... Uh, all of the stuff that's come out of spare has made him look like an idiot and she's hung him out to dry. Um, she has kept a low profile. She didn't do any promotional work so that she basically turn around and say to him, you stupid man, look what you've done. Our popularity has plummeted. It's your fault because of what you're talking about, your frozen todger, etc. You're a moron. You're an idiot. And so she is looking to distance herself from him and that royal connection because the royal connection has more or less burnt itself out. The Royal Connection got her the elevation. The victimhood has been milked. Most people aren't going to go. She'll still do it because she can't help it, but it's not really going to provide the dividends because most people are bored of it now. Even her supporters are tired of hearing the whining that goes on. So she's got to find something else. But the problem is she doesn't have any strings to her bow. What's she going to do? Write a successful series of books? No, she's boring. She's nothing to say. She regurgitates anecdotes that we've heard so many times before and, and invariably aren't even her accomplishments, character trait acquisition. What's she going to do? Write some brilliant screenplay and win an Oscar? No. What's she going to do? Set up some tech company? No. She might invest in them, but even then there's no guarantee that that's going to provide her. She has no, as I say, no inherent talent that she can harness. So what she has to do is be a parasite and leech off somebody else. And that's the route that she'll go down. <laughs> the reality <laughs> that's the reality for anyone who thinks you know she's living the high life that's that's actually the reality uh -huh. that she is a parasite it's quite remarkable is there anything else that you would like to share with us um 
All I would say in closing is that if you think that you're dealing with a narcissist, come and access my work. It'll help you understand more. Come and speak to me. You can arrange a consultation, use the NARC detector, and then you can join the millions of people that I've helped achieve freedom and understanding, and your life will be far better for it. Thank you for that. And as I said, I'm going to share everything down below on the YouTube channel, all of your links. And I am so grateful that you took the time to speak with speak with not just me, but everybody that is going to watch this video today. You have been unbelievably gracious with your time and with sharing your knowledge and your wisdom and your firsthand understanding of what it is to be a narcissist. I am truly grateful. Thank you so much. You're more than welcome, Faye. Thank you. And I hope that everybody that is watching this has enjoyed this and go check out HG Tutor. He is a wealth of information. Thank you so much. Okay. Good. <laughs> All done. Would you send the video to me so I can upload it onto my channel as well, please, Faye? Absolutely. I would be happy to. Thank you so much. No, no problem at all. Well, I must dash as I have a lady in Hawaii to speak to in a couple of minutes time to help her with her issues. So pleasure to have spoken to you. And if you'd like to do it again, I'd be more than happy to do so. Thank you for your questions. And uh, I'll wait to hear from you with the video. Absolutely. I think this is going to spark a lot of follow up questions from my community. So sure. after I'm going to put this up in about one week's time on Tuesday. And okay. then once it goes up, I'll Give it a couple of days, let people watch it, ask for any follow-up questions and reach out to you again. No problem at all. Thanks, babe. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.